They burn oil. They're low on torque. And they eat apex seals for breakfast. So why is the rotary engine so beloved by gearheads? And what the f is an apex seal? Well, today we're gonna find out. Let's go over how they work, let's do some history, talk about the pros and cons, and why they rule, even though they really shouldn't. It's time to do a deep dive on the rotary. Hey, we partnered with ButcherBox to bring you this week's episode. ButcherBox is a subscription service that delivers high quality meats right to your door. They offer 100% grass-fed beef, free-range organic chicken, wild-caught salmon, and heritage breed pork. You can choose a pre-selected box or even customize your own. I'm a sensitive guy who loves his veggies, but cook me a juicy burger and I'm all yours. Lucky for you, ButcherBox has a special offer for donut fans. If you sign up right now, you'll get $20 off plus two pounds of delicious salmon, and 10 ounces of bacon free. Head over to butcherbox.com slash wheelhouse right now and sign up. Support the companies that support Donut. Get yourself some freaking meat, baby. All right, I'm gonna pass out. In my opinion, people who still drive rotary-powered cars are the hardest core car nerds of all, and they have to be. When comparing a rotary engine to a piston engine, the rotary is objectively worse in pretty much every way. Winkle rotaries are so much worse that nobody sells a car with one in it anymore. Here's basically how it works. The rotor itself is a triangle with rounded sides called a relu triangle, AKA the Dorito. It spins around an eccentric crankshaft that runs through the middle of an oval shaped housing. It's not a true oval though, it's called an epitrochoid. Each point of the rotor has a little thingy in it and those are the infamous apex seals. They create three sealed pockets of air against the inside edge of the housing. Because of the shape of the housing, those pockets get smaller or larger depending on where the rotor is. As the space expands, air and fuel get sucked in through the intake port. Then, as the rotor moves further along, it compresses the mixture. On the other side of the housing, you have your spark and combustion, and then that explodey pocket of air gets pushed around to the exhaust port. For every three turns of the crankshaft, the rotor makes one complete circuit around the inside of the housing. German engineer Felix Wankel came up with the original idea for a pistonless engine in 1919. His first version, called the DKM, had both a spinning housing and a spinning rotor and made 21 horsepower, which wasn't the best idea. The second version, called the KKM, was reworked by Hans Dieter Pasch to have a stationary housing with only the rotor spinning around inside. That was the ticket, and that's how they're all designed now. The KKM prototype was so simple, smooth, and quiet that other manufacturers rushed to license the tech from NSU. The 1964 NSU Spider was the first production car to be powered by a rotary. It was a tiny engine with only a single rotor. It was in the back, so there was room for both a frunk and a trunk. It looked great, revved high, and had more power than its competition. So it should have done well, right? Well, instead it tanked. The apex seals didn't work right, and the rotor was scarring the inside of the housing. They stopped making it in 1967 with less than 2,400 cars sold. NSU fixed the apex seal issue by 1970 and sold the RO80 until 1977, but only a few thousand cars a year. Their rotary never recovered from the bad reputation. Mazda, on the other hand, took their time and made sure their rotary launched with fewer problems and introduced their first Wankel with two rotors in the 1967 Cosmo sports car. But to keep them compliant with new emission standards, they had to make changes that hurt the fuel economy. And to keep the apex seals happy, the engines had to burn oil. Despite all that though, Mazda seemed to have cured the worst of the reliability problems and put rotaries into other models for 30 more years. The rotary engine RX2 sold from 1970 to 78, the RX3 from 71 to 78, the RX4 from 72 to 79. Mazda even made the world's only rotary engine pickup truck, the REPU. They were so confident in the Winkel that when they launched it in 1974, they had a big rotary power in caps across the tailgate. But since trucks kinda need low-end torque, it was dead by 1977. 
RIP. The Cosmo was the longest running rotary nameplate. Cosmo. You could get the luxurious final generation with a two liter sequential twin turbo three rotor Winkle making 300 horsepower and almost 300 foot pounds of torque. These things are awesome. And the Cosmo had a long life, but a super high price tag and horrible MPGs finished it off Overkill. in 1996. GM also spent a lot of dough to make the rotary a viable option. Like I mentioned in the C8 Corvette episode a few weeks ago, GM put rotaries in a few mid-engine vet concepts back in the day. The Chevy Vega was supposed to get a rotary, but every time they improved one thing about the engine, something else started to suck. Weird engines that people didn't understand, weren't always reliable, and didn't even get good gas mileage were a tough sell to begin with. Then the oil embargo happened and that was probably the nail in the coffin. Almost every other company also threw in the towel on the rotary by 1980. Mazda was the only automaker who didn't give up. A legend among today's sports cars. The RX-7 launched in 1978 and more than 811,000 of them were sold before production ended in 2002. One of the things that helps it sound so good is the fact that a rotary can rev higher than a piston engine can. That's just how it works. There are no valves, valve trains, connecting rods, or a crankshaft really. It's easy to fit into super small cars and can be placed lower and further back in the engine bay. That lowers the center of gravity, gives the car better weight distribution, and fewer pounds per horsepower. That's the stuff that sports car dreams are made of, my friend. The lightweight, rev-happy RX-7 won races and gearheads' hearts all over. The first DB rotary For most rotary heads, it was their first introduction to the pistonless engine. Sadly though, the rise of the SUV and unfavorable exchange rates killed the RX-7. This is the final time that we will see the RX-7 as we know it in IMSA competition with full factory support. The underpowered warranty nightmare RX-8 replaced it in 2004 to 2012, and it didn't fare nearly as well. People didn't know how to maintain them, and tighter emission standards and bad fuel economy really hurt sales. You can't expect the rotary to be at the same level when so much less time and money has been spent on it. I wonder where the rotary could have been today if the same amount of time and money had gone into it. Even though there are plenty of reasons the rotary should have faded into the sunset, a certain set of gearheads fell hopelessly in love with them. Kind of like automotive hipsters. They just want to do things a little differently, and I don't blame them. Yeah, sure, there's a better way to do it, but damn it, doing it the weirder and harder way makes it more interesting. Because the rotary is so different, it's intimidating at first. There's a ton of vacuum lines, first of all, and if you add a turbo, they're notoriously hard to tune without blowing an apex seal first. Plus. It's kind of like playing Halo on Legendary, right? Automatically makes you one of the cool kids. Because if you drive a Winkle, it means you've got that sh figured out. Like my buddy Aaron said, you can't stumble into a good rotary build. When they're working right, there's nothing else like them. Mazda proved rotaries can be reliable way back in 1968, when a Cosmo finished fourth in the 3,000 mile long Marathon de la Route road race. Mazda was also the first Japanese manufacturer to win the 24 Hours of Le Mans with a four-rotor 787B in 1991. To drive the car is absolutely fantastic, and at the moment, we're in a good shape to win. Which brings me to the sound. Holy crap, there's nothing as sick as a rotary. Just listen to the 787B scream down the track at 9,000 RPM. Listen to Aaron's Wolf RX-7 at idle. I bet if you ask Aaron, or Hurt from Hoonigan, and Mad Mike Wadette what their favorite things are about rotaries, the sound would probably be at the top of the list. The more I talk about these things, the more I'm on. As long as we still have gasoline, oil, and internal combustion engines, there are going to be a few badasses out there keeping the rotary alive. And I, I salute you, my friends. Thank you. Be nice, I'll see you next time.